Welcome to today's episode of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Zamantungwa Kumalo. It's day 20 of the national lockdown today. And of course, we'll be bringing you the latest in property news, bringing in different experts to help us navigate how to best make um, you know, good decisions for our property. And on tonight's show, I'm joined by Stephen Whitcomb, who is the National Sales Manager at Better Bond. And given that we've had a, a, a recent interest rate cut um, announced yesterday by the Reserve and governor that took into effect today we'll be exploring um you know given the new interest rates what are the three best financial steps when buying your first home we'll also touch a little bit on if you already have a first home and perhaps you want to add to be thinking of and of course if you want to be part of the conversation you can send us your questions right here on facebook and we'll be sure to ask our guests you can also uh, share some of your questions on our other social media platforms and if you've missed out on yesterday's episode or other episodes uh, we've already posted last night's episode on our um, youtube channel so you can always go back and watch that um, and of course i'd like to now introduce uh, my guest Stephen. thank you so much for joining us this evening Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Now, you know, a lot of people are, are quite excited, or certainly people who are, you know, interested in property or have been looking at property, they're quite excited about this lower interest rate um, and want to look at different ways that they can take advantage of it. And of course, a very big demographic are probably people who wanted to buy their first home um, and had already been looking and are now thinking, okay, perhaps I'm ready to make that offer. And I want to just have a little chat about, you know, what are some of the financial considerations that they need to be thinking of um, as they embark on buying their first home? Sure. Go ahead. What would you like? So, so first of all, I think the interest rate reduction was amazing news for yeah. the country. Um, not only will it help protect um, existing consumers with debt and help alleviate some of the interest um, on their debt that they have, but for uh, buyers looking to enter the market and, and, and buy a home, um, the prime lending rate is 7.75 currently. Um, and I think that's the lowest it's been in several years. So really a really good opportunity um, to take advantage of low interest rates. I think for buyers, um, whether you're buying for the first time or you're buying a second property or a third property, um, it's critical that buyers understand that, first of all, how much they qualify for. I think that's the most important thing. Once you know what you qualify for, um, you would then be able to look at your personal financials or personal finances to ensure that you have sufficient funds to, re to repay the bond that you're looking at, uh, at, at giving. And so, Stephen, how would somebody actually be even able to assess how much they qualify for? So, so through, through a reputable, reputable uh, bond originator, I think the best thing would be to do is for them to get pre-qualified. Um, and we offer that service at Better Bond where, where buyers are able to approach us, um, request um, for a pre-qualification. And at Better Bond, what we do is we simply look at the client's declared income. Um, and, and many clients have various sources of income. So we look at all the sources of income that they, that they have. We then critically look at the client's declared expenses. And when we issue a pre-qualification, we actually go into quite a lot of detail around what they've declared versus what, um, for example, is going through their bank statements to ensure that when we do issue them with a certificate, um, they know that when they go to market, um, it's, it's really, really a good document to go to market with because they know exactly what they qualify for. So, Stephen, I actually wanted to take it a step back. I mean, you and I yes. know a little bit about property and know what pre-qualification is, what a bond originator is, but I'm sure some of our listeners and, you know, people watching us at home might not have even heard of, you know, bond origination or pre-qualification. Um, perhaps yes. explain what the pre-qualification process, like, is. Almost like you're explaining to somebody who's never heard it before, um, so that we can begin to slowly understand the steps that you're essentially going to have to take when you decide to buy that first home. Okay, so you, so you asked the question of whether or not the viewers actually understand bond origination. So let me quickly touch on bond origination. I think that's more important. So buyers approach us in order for us to apply at various banks to get them the best home loan deal. So we have contracts with all the four retail banks um, together with some of the private banks and we're able to submit a client's application to multiple banks free of charge, giving them the best outcome. So that's basically in a nutshell what bond origination does. Our services are free of charge. Um, and we would then submit the client's application to all the banks 
the banks would then present us with various offers. Um, they might um, very well be all different, different interest rates, different loan amounts, based on exactly what they assess in terms of the client's risk. We will then present those offers to the client, um, and then the client will make an informed decision based on the best offer that suits them. So and what are some of the sure. and and uh, you know I I tend to preach using a bond originator, especially in the early days of building a property portfolio. Um, myself, I've used bond originators previously uh, when buying you know the various properties that I have. Um, can you just tell us what some of the benefits are of using a bond originator as opposed to perhaps approaching the various banks individually when you're ready to buy um, your your new home? Sure. So we would submit one application. So the client with a bond originator would complete one application. If he was applying to various banks, he would have to approach each of the banks individually, complete individual applications, and the supporting documents would have to then, in terms of his pay slips and bank statements, etc., would have to then be submitted to each bank individually if he approached them individually. We apply on behalf of the client. We, we complete one application, one set of supporting documents, and we submit that to the banks that meet the client's loan requirements. So if clients are looking for 80 or 90 or 100% loan, the purchase price, for example, is a million rand, um, and he's looking for a 90% bond, so he's looking for a 900,000 rand loan, he has a 100,000 rand deposit, we would look at which banks are currently um, viewing loan-to-value policies or the loan-to-value of the, the different policies of the banks, and we would submit to those various banks accordingly. Um, it would only be one submission. We then get feedback from the banks, we follow up on behalf of and the client in terms of feedback. Uh, we get the outcomes, we get um, the approvals, and where we need to, um, and we often do, is we will negotiate the best interest rate for the client. Because bearing in mind, we're now sitting with potentially three or four offers on the table. Mm -hmm. From that, we're able to then go back to the client's own bank, which we've applied to, together with other banks to secure, not firstly, the best loan amount, but also secondly, the best interest rate. And I think for me, that was one of the things that I quite liked um, when I was using a bond originator was that you get, suppose, I think in one of the transactions, I got three different um, offers from three different banks and the interest rates were, were different. So with all of them, they were granting 100% across the board, but the interest yes. rates were different. So then I was able to say, actually, let's see if we can get the, the bank, like my preferred bank, to lower the interest rate um, based on the lowest offer. So able to essentially have that conversation with the bank and almost have them essentially fight for your business as much as possible um, before you choose the bank that you actually want to go, um, to go with. Um, sure. now I, and, and I think it's just such a big component that people probably aren't even aware of that you're able to do that with your bond originator because you know the first offer that you get from a bank or the first grant that the bank says they'll be able to give you isn't necessarily the only one or necessarily set in stone. I mean, oftentimes banks might actually um, be able to, you're able to negotiate that rate lower with banks. Um, now, you know, so now Stephen, what I want us to also then look at is how do we then navigate what somebody can, can afford in the event where they already have their primary residence, for example, and they're looking to buy that additional property. So let's say the, you, you essentially stayed in your same uh, job, so your salary hasn't really increased. Um, and you're now perhaps uh, obviously using the rental from, let's say, let's say, you, for example, you're even, even able to rent out one of the bedrooms in your house. So you're getting a little bit of extra income. How do you typically factor in that additional rental income? Because I know different banks use a different percentage of how much they consider it. They don't all um, consider it 100% you know, income, some will do 50 or 70. So how do you, as, as bond originators, essentially help your clients in making a case for themselves when trying to buy that additional property? So when it comes to additional properties and using existing rentals on properties that you already own, it does become a little bit more complicated and using an originator just makes much more sense. Um, because we're very aware of all the bank's policies, to your point, you've made a You've made the point that some banks will consider 70% of the rental, 50% of the rental, 100% of the rental, and it all depends where you bank. Um, will they consider because you bank with them 100% of the rental? So, so should clients try to apply directly at each of the banks, it can become quite complicated. We, this is what we do. In you know, bond origination, we know exactly what the banks are looking at, what percentages they're looking at, and accordingly, we will advise customers on best ways 
to apply or we'll apply on their behalf um, to get the best outcome. Um, but to answer your question, you, you, you're 100%. So banks will consider different percentages of your rent. So, so rather than um, if, if anyone has specific questions around um, specific banks, banks and their rentals and what percentages they use, they, use, they can, they, they can uh, send in a question. Um, but it does, it does get complicated. Um, and, if you, and for example, if you're currently living in your property, um, some banks won't consider the rental on that property for the purchase of a new property because that would be seen as future rental. Um, and future rental, some banks will not consider, some banks will. Um, hence another reason why you should be applying to a bond originator because we know which banks will consider future rental and which ones won't. Mm. So if you're just joining us, this is a private property uh, podcast. I'm your host, Zamandunga Kumalo, and I've got Stephen Whitcomb, who's the National Sales Manager at Better Bond. And we're looking at some of the financial considerations when buying your uh, first home, given that we've got um, lower interest rates right now, or perhaps even looking at an additional property and you're looking at how you can best take advantage of lower interest rates right now in uh, building on your current property portfolio. Now, Stephen, you know, what are some of the other considerations? I mean, so the first one that you've said is that you need to essentially be able to assess what you can afford, right? And you're doing that in different ways. We're looking at your income versus your expenditure. So essentially it becomes quite important for um, any customer to be able to do a balance sheet. And some of the banks even give you a balance sheet. You're able to find free templates online that are able to help you, you know, do a, a balance sheet. And for you to also see how much money do you have left at the end of the month? Are you able to you know, afford a bond installment? Is it significantly higher than what you're currently renting? Um, what are some of the other financial considerations that uh, prospective new home owners should actually be thinking about when looking at buying a new home? I think a good benchmark to mention is that banks will generally look at up to a maximum of 30% of a buyer's total gross income. Okay, so as an example, if you were to earn 10,000 Rand a month, banks would consider that... Um, your repayments cannot exceed on home loan finance to, to the total of 3,000 Rand and um, affordability would have to be in place. So if your affordability and your net disposable income after all your expenses have gone through um, was in excess of 3,000 Rand, then you stand a good chance. Now, now we've been talking income and expenditure and we've been talking, um, uh, now I've mentioned uh, the, the policy around 30% of your gross income. But one of the other factors that's very, very critical in applying for a home loan is that the client has a very, very clear um, credit bureau. Um, clients need to ensure that they maintain their credit bureau over a period of time and ensure that they pay their debts on time every single month. And because that's one thing before a bank will even assess the affordability of the home loan is to ensure that the buyer that's applying has been able to um, pay their debts religiously um, over a period of time. And I mean, when we're looking at your credit score, what, you know, so what's the essential, like what's essentially the range um, that's relatively good in, in getting um, a home loan? Because I know sometimes some people say if you're on the lower end of a good range, you're more likely to get slightly higher interest rates. Whereas when you're slightly on the higher end, then you're more likely to, to be able to even negotiate with the bank in terms of uh, lowering the interest rate. I think from a credit bureau point of view, I think it also gets very complicated. There is no exact science around what score you're required to have in order to get financed. I think the best advice that I can give is that if you continue to pay your accounts on time every single month, um, then you won't be reported or recorded as a slow pay or a, or a bad debt, um, which, which the banks will definitely frown upon. Um, and to your point, I think it's also fair to say that if your score is high, you stand a much better chance of securing an approval with a, with a, with a better interest rate than if your score was relatively low. Um, and the banks would then apply some form of risk and that they generally do in the form of a higher interest rate. So you're spot on. So if you, so if you, are, um, if you have handled your accounts um, on an av you know, average deal or you haven't paid once or twice and your score is low, um, the chances are that if they do decide to approve your loan, then um, your interest rates will be high. So best to, if you are thinking of buying, is um, ensure that your retail debt and your financial debt is kept up to date all the time. Now, one of the other things that we always have to think about when buying a new home is, of course, the deposit, which is quite a substantial amount. Some people say you must have 10%, some people say 20%. What is the importance of having a, um, a deposit? Should somebody even be budgeting for a deposit, especially for their primary residence? 
Yeah, so if you're a buyer and you're looking to buy a property, um, first of all, and we'll just take a back step quickly. So you have to ensure that you have a clear credit record. You have to ensure that you have affordability to meet the repayments of the loan. And if you are able to save up a deposit, then that's amazing because the more deposit you're able to provide, the bank's risk then reduces. Risk sits more with the buyer because of the deposit that they put into buying the property. And then your rates are likely to be better with a deposit. And the higher your deposit you, that you're able to provide, the better rates that you'll get. Um, and that's not to say that clients can't get 100% bonds. Um, banks are currently approving 100% bonds. Yeah. Um, and, and that would be good. And that would in all likelihood be to buyers that have got a really good credit rating um, and will consider 100% bonds. The banks will do that. Um, but where buyers, and that's our advice, where buyers have a deposit, it's always best to put down a deposit. And the benchmark I would I would say for a deposit is anything between five to ten percent as a starting point. And I mean, you you, you actually look quite great. I I remember I think with the first um, two properties I bought myself, I you know, I initially thought perhaps I'll have uh, challenges with getting a hundred percent bond, and I was able to get a hundred percent bond without needing to put down a deposit. Um, and I suppose there are different factors that then banks look into when granting a 100% bond or even a 90% bond without needing a deposit. You know, I'm young, you're working, and they're probably thinking you're, you're going to be able to pay, you've got a very good credit score. Um, perhaps yeah. if you could just shed a bit of light around some of the different factors that banks look into when um, granting, whether it's a 100% um, bond or even um, really lower interest rates? Because I think that's one of the questions that a lot of question marks that people typically have, that they're a bit uncertain about what are these different things like. So granted, you're working and suppose you're servicing your various debts well, um, but if you put in two applications that are relatively similar, um, you're still not getting the same you know, interest rate or the one party might be granted 100% and another 90 So people really want this issue demystified a bit around some of the different factors that banks actually look into before they um, extend that loan facility to us. Okay, so to answer that question, the first thing that banks would look at is your credit profile. If you have debt in your name and you have been um, paying it off religiously and it's been um, and it's been for some time that you've been paying it off, then the banks can see that you comfortably have debt in your name, whether it's retail or financial debt, you are able to pay it, you are paying it, and that's a good thing. The opposite to that is where we find that buyers do not have any debt in their name. Yeah. So they have financial debt currently or no retail debt currently. So the banks would then look back and say, well, if we haven't, if we cannot see that buyers have experienced having debt and have experienced repaying debt, that is where the percentages start to drop in terms of the percentage loan to the purchase price that you're applying for that the bank will consider. Um, no credit history is, is not good. Having a credit history that is paid up and um, paid on time and paid every month is good. So and, after how long, and, and after how long are you able to mitigate something like that, right? Because I, I think we tend to find, especially with young professionals who, suppose you're a young professional, you didn't take any debts because you're probably just scared of having a store account or credit card, and you now want to start you know, buying a new home and you don't have a credit score. After how long, uh, let's say you go and get a cell phone contract or you sign up for a gym membership, so you try and build up some sort of credit score. After how many months can it be essentially credible that, okay, this is a true reflection of your credit score and the bank will believe that, okay, this person, we can see that they've got maybe one credit or two, um, uh, two, two things that they're paying off and they've paid it off while in the past three months. Um, what kind of buffer should somebody essentially give themselves when they are trying to um, have a good credit score or build a credit score? Well, first of, first of all, the banks, when they look at your credit score, they look at, they look at how you've repaid your debt over a period of 12 to 24 months. So I'm not saying you need to have um, that cell phone contract or that gym contract for 12 to 24 months. Um, my best guess would be that you need to have it for a good three to six months um, would give the bank a good indication of how you've repaid 
um, those accounts over the last three to six months. That would be a start. Um, but, you know, a lot of buyers believe that, you know, they take out a cell phone contract today, they pay it, they pay it for one month, um, and then they have a credit rating or a credit um, history. Um, the longer you have it, the better your chances of, of, of getting a higher loan from the bank in terms of percentage to purchase price. Which is a bit unfortunate, I suppose, for people who want to not have debt, <laughs> but want to get into the property market. So it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting balancing act that you must do because then the, the type of debt that you'd essentially be taking on in order to build up that credit profile mustn't be bad debt, like you know, taking a store account and then maxing it out or maxing out a credit, um, credit card. Um, so if you just possible, this, if, if I could just come in there, it, it is possible to have debt, um, but good debt. To your yeah. point, a phone contract is something that's um, not bad debt. A gym contract isn't necessarily a, a thing that's bad debt. Having a credit card, but ensuring that it's paid up in full every single month, or having it as a savings facility to um, to save money in and um, um, etc., is not necessarily bad debt. So we're definitely not encouraging people to go out and take debt on. That's not mm -hmm. the intention. The intention is for them to take on debt facilities and just be good payers around it um, and ensuring that they keep their payments up to date. And I think, uh, you know, before we you know, take in a few questions around this, um, you know, any other financial factors that we should be considering? Because I think, you know, as I think and reflect even on my own property journey, something that we typically don't think about are some of the other costs associated with home ownership. Um, and people typically don't tend to factor those in, whether it's paying levies in, if, if you're you know, going to be living in, in a complex. You know, what other factors should prospective home buyers be thinking of before they actually go on and embark on that home ownership journey? So, so first of all, the deposit, if where, and where they can save, it would be great to do a deposit. And then secondly, then you would always have to consider your bond registration and your transfer fees. Mm -hmm. so, so as you know, transfer fees um, are not paid for properties up to 1.5 million. Um, I think that's the figure you can... Uh, it's slightly lower than that. I think it was, I think, I think it's 900. Yeah, it's 900, if I remember correctly. I think it was okay. seven, 700, then they got increased, I think it was to 900. Earlier yeah. this year. So if you're buying a property within that range, um, you luckily have no transfer fees payable, and you would have bond fees that are payable. So those are additional costs that you would need to consider. Um, but costs around the home, in terms of your levies um, and water and lights, often people coming out of living with parents or um, having rented a property, those are the new costs potentially that they would have to consider and that the banks look at when they assess your application. So they consider those things and they build in um, buffers to ensure that any additional costs that could be incurred on a monthly basis when taking on a new home loan um, are included in the assessment of the application. Uh, so we've got a comment here that says um, the bond origination service seems too good to be true, how come it's for free? Okay. It's a very, very good question. So our services to the, to the buyer is absolutely free of charge. Um, we earn an income from the bank um, based on the deals that we place with them. Um, and um, yeah, so, so to the buyer, it's completely free of charge. Um, our income is earned from the bank and we have contracts with the banks and they pay us a commission. And so essentially somebody would never have, because I mean, online you tend to see quite a lot of stuff. Early in the conversation, you were citing that you should be working with a reputable um, bond originator like yourselves at Better Bond. Is there any context where somebody who says they're a bond originator and perhaps not working for some of the bigger um, institutions that we know of, um, would they be charging you? Is there any context where they would actually charge you for that service? So that shouldn't be allowed. In no way should it be allowed. Um, the banks are very, very specific on um, bond originators um, charging onto buyers. And if at any point um, they feel um, a buyer is being asked um, for a fee um, to originate their bond for them, um, then they should be in contact with the banks immediately and directly with them and let them know. It's not allowed. And what are some of the things that uh, you know, people should be looking out for when dealing with um, a bond originator? And by that, I mean, what are the things that your bond originator is basically going to ask you when you deal with them? Because I know, I remember the first time that I was working with a bond originator, I was asked a lot of you know, documents and it was a bit, 
not only was it daunting, but a part of me was like, wait, but this is literally my whole life. <laughs> you can go and create another profile and like take all kinds of debt in my name. So there's a part of me that was quite anxious about, you know, the prospects of giving so many documents away for, to a, a person who's a bond originator. And back then, I also didn't know much about bond originators. So there was a bit of skepticism. Um, luckily, the, they were referred to me by a, a very good friend that I trusted who was in the property space. So had it not been for sort of that connection, there was probably going to be a part of me that was going to be slightly skeptical, thinking, no, 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 I'm, asked, I'm being asked for so many FICA documents. Is this even... Is this even, are they going to be using my documents legally? Why am I being asked for so many documents? Yeah, so the list of documents that um, the bank requires is quite a lengthy list of documents. Um, so we treat um, each client, um, the, the dealings that we have with each client and their documents extremely confidential. Um, um, and we um, have a contract with the bank that um, enforces us to ensure that we have and apply the strictest rules regarding the confidentiality of the dealings with our buyers and the documents that they provide us. But to your point, the list is to some extent some, uh, quite exhaustive, uh, um, um, from bank statements to pay slips, you name it. Um, but that's the best way to assess a client in terms of their affordability and those are the documents that the banks require for us to submit onto them. And I must say, I mean, it's, at some point I thought, am, am I going to be asked for uh, you know, my blood type and my liver because I was sending so many attachments. Um, so you literally be looking at your, your, I think it was a three month bank statement. You're looking at a pay slip, you're looking at your ID. Then there's a very lengthy form that you fill in um, that obviously you're filling in all your details, but then you're also filling in, you know, your expenses um, and listing all your expenses, listing yeah. how much, you know, each expense is. So even things like cleaning services. So you, if you've got a helper who comes in at home, you must be filling that stuff in. So if, if anything, the paperwork to, to owning a new home is quite exhaustive that so many of us actually don't realize um, just how administratively heavy it is. Um, yes. And I'm sure so many people at home, I mean, I know every time I have to fill in those forms, I feel as though, oh my God, like not this again, right? Um, so we've got, a, um, we've got a question, and I don't know if you're able to answer this one, uh, from Vivian Hoffman who asked, why didn't they leave the deeds of office open for registration? Which I know so many people would have probably liked to, to have open. Yeah, so it is disappointing that it wasn't seen as an essential service. Um, let's hope that President um, Ramaphosa decides given the second two weeks of our lockdown, that it is considered an essential service. I think for a lot of people within the real estate business, um, it's how they earn their income. It's how um, um, many attorneys in terms of conveyancing earn, earn their income and as well as bond origination in terms of how we earn our income. Um, if bonds don't register, there's no income. So mm -hmm. I think that um, decisions will be made in the next few days regarding potentially um, opening up the deeds office. Um, and if not, um, then let's hope and pray we get to the 1st of May or the 4th of May um, quicker than, uh, quicker than uh, uh, as, soon as, as soon as possible so that we can get the deed office open and we can start generating some registrations and income for our industry. I mean, I'm, one thing I know is, or it's not even a, in a matter of fact, I think one of the things that we're speculating is that it may potentially, uh, we may have more days added on. I mean, if we keep looking at, um, reports from different parts of the world, they're, they're different sentiments. So I think one of the, one of the things that certainly the property industry and for, has been citing is that they would have liked the, the deeds office to be open because then in the event where there are also other people who would have probably wanted to take advantage of um, the lower interest rates right now, then they'd also be able to, to do so and perhaps ultimately their, their uh, property registered. Now, before we wrap up, um, Stephen, are there any other uh, tips that you'd like to convey to our our listeners and our viewers at home? So I'd like to just uh, just to mention the pre-qualification as an ending point. I think if there are any buyers or listeners that are looking at buying property, um, they can definitely contact Better Bond, and we'll definitely assist them with a, a pre-qualification. We will ask for that lengthy set of documents, and we. Will <laughs> Now complete what we have a two-page application, not a ten-page application. Oh wow, that's incredible! Yeah, we have condensed it over the years, um, but also just bear in mind that when we do submit to multiple banks, um, 
we need to try and satisfy the bank's requirements. And each of the bank's requirements can differ. So, yeah. and that's from a supporting document point of view. So you talk bank statements. If I, was, if I were applying to a buyer's own bank, I wouldn't need bank statements. But the fact that we're able to apply to other retail banks, um, then we would require the bank statements in order to get uh, the application to those banks. Um, and if clients are looking at buying, and I think now is an ideal time to buy, um, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty around um, what's going on cur currently in the country with the lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. But I think with interest rates where they are now, now would be a good time to buy. Um, and if they want pre-qualification, if they want that document, they can um, just um, log onto our webpage. Uh, we've got another question here from Gatlejo Pache, who asks, how can one navigate the home loan application process if they are working on a contract basis? So, so there's nothing wrong with working on a contract basis. The banks will consider loans for people that are on contract basis. Uh, it depends in, in what line of profession you are. Um, um, that, that, that makes somewhat of a difference. And it also depends on the term of your contract and, and the so main term of your contract. Remember, you know, remember the bond term is over 20 years generally, from 20 to 30 years. So, so if you're permanently employed, then that money is paid to you monthly. But if you're on a contract and that contract extends um, over a couple of years, um, then great. But if it only extends over the, a few months, um, depending on the profession you are in, uh, we would have to consider all those points and then submit the application. Okay, I'm going to um, wrap up with you, Stephen. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. I think Thank you so um, much. this is really quite insightful. Um, if anything, we're doing our best to help each other uh, make the best property decisions um, during this time. And for you at home, if you've missed any of our episodes, we are uploading them on our YouTube channel so you can check out all our previous episodes. And of course, you can always keep sending your questions and suggestions just below and we'll be in touch. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much.